This is the Mahabharata Podcast, Episode 22, The Second Dice Game. Last time, our heroes were invited to view the Karva's fancy new casino and challenged to play a friendly game of dice. King Yudhishthira, saying he had sworn eternal oath never to turn down a challenge, agreed to the game, and even allowed Duryodhana's cheating uncle Shakuni to handle the dice on his nephew's behalf. As nearly everyone expected, Shakuni used some kind of sleight of hand to win at every single throw of the dice. Yudhishthira eventually gambled away all his wealth, his kingdom, and finally his and his brother's freedom. Having lost everything, Shakuni suggested that Yudhishthira stake his dear wife Draupadi. Again, citing his oath, Yudhishthira gambled and lost the freedom of his own wife. Draupadi did not accept this lightly, however, and she put up a fight in every way she could, first refusing to be taken, then arguing that she had been won unfairly, and then pleading the finer points of princely dharma with Duryodhana's blind father, King Dhritarashtra, and finally seeking the sympathies of the eldest Kuru prince, Bhishma, Ganji's son. While Draupadi's arguments all failed to get a ruling in her favor, she was miraculously spared the violation of being stripped in the open court by wicked cousin Dushasan. As he removed her garments, a new garment appeared instantly in its place. Draupadi's determined resistance finally broke whatever spell that was on the blind king, and Dhritarashtra finally put a stop to the shenanigans, restored the Pandava's freedom, and gave them back their kingdom. Everything was put back just the way it was before the dice match, except there was no erasing the oaths Bhima made to drink Dushasan's blood and to break Duryodhana's thigh with his club. Even worse, there was no way the king could allay the fear and hatred that burned in the heart of his eldest son Duryodhana. The boy was bound to attempt another preemptive strike sooner or later. Before we get into Duryodhana's next plan of attack, there's some strange things about the first dice game that I would like to address. First of all, the whole episode is kind of strange. The characters seem oddly somnambulistic, and their behaviors are difficult to explain. To begin with, when Shakuni first proposes holding the dice match, he claims that Yudhishthira is known to be a gambling addict, but is also bad at it. Perhaps he was knowingly telling a lie, because otherwise we have no evidence that Yudhishthira ever even played the game, let alone enjoyed it, or played to excess. Furthermore, before the game begins, Yudhishthira makes a brief sermon on the evils of the game. The next oddity in the story is Yudhishthira's repeated reference to an oath that he would not turn down any challenge. In the Bombay edition of the Mahabharata, we're conveniently provided with the scene where Yudhishthira swears an oath roughly to this effect. The critical edition, however, makes no mention of the scene, but still has the king referring to some unmentioned oath. As I mentioned briefly last episode, the critical edition describes a miracle in which Dushasan is unable to strip the princess bare, but it does not ascribe any agency behind it. The miracle just happens. On the other hand, everyone knows that it was Krishna who saved Draupadi in her moment of distress. The Bombay edition makes this explicit, and every depiction of this scene in popular art and fiction shows Krishna magically producing garments for the beleaguered princess. If this imagined original did not have Krishna involved in this scene, then does this suggest that maybe Krishna was a less important figure at one time? Is it possible that Krishna's importance was built up in the story over time? These questions highlight the dangers of even trying to identify some original story among the many versions we have today. Rather than trying to struggle with these questions, I prefer to give you the story as people know it today in modern India. And that means it was Krishna who intervened and saved Draupadi from humiliation. Before we move on with the story, I just want to point out a couple of additional peculiarities in this last episode. This would be the strange behavior of both Bhishma and Yudhishthira. Bhishma, who in earlier episodes marks himself out as a decisive man of action, is strangely addled in this episode. He sits watching outrages being committed against his grandnephews and their wife, and is somehow unable to put a stop to it. Yudhishthira is even worse in this respect. Even if we accept the oath he made to accept any challenge, no one suggested that he stake his titles and his freedom in the dice game. These were his decision alone. Finally, while his wife was enduring abuse unfit for even a prostitute, he was totally inactive. If this was some sort of passive-aggressive rebuke to his elders, I think he took it too far. There is something of an explanation for all this provided by the author, and that is that they were all blinded by fate to go through with this drama. 
The scene was necessary because later events would depend on it, so it happened because it had to happen. We left off with the departure of the Pandavas from Hastinapur. We are not told of their mood as they left the city, but Bhima had sworn some oaths that could not be taken back, even if he obeyed their uncle's wishes and held no resentment. Duryodhana had certainly not forgotten what had happened and the grave danger posed by Bhima's oaths, and he was determined not to stand by and allow his cousins to get their revenge. The conspirators Duryodhana, his brother Dushasan, friend Karna, and uncle Shakuni went together to the king. The prince was naturally frightened and angry to see his enemies walk out of the trap. He beseeched the blind king, Father, the Pandavas have put on their swords and mounted their chariots in their rage. Arjun has uncovered his quivers and keeps plucking at his Gandiva bow. The wolf belly Bhima is swinging his club. We have offended them, and they will never forgive us. Who among them could forgive the molestation of Draupadi? The conspirators must have already worked out their new plan, because Duryodhana set to lobbying his father. We must have one more dice match, and send them to the forest. Let whoever gets defeated go into the forest, clad in deerskins for twelve years. On the thirteenth year, let them go in hiding, disguised among the people. And if they are found out, they will return to the forest for another twelve years. It will be them or us. So let's have one more roll of the dice. And if they survive the vow after thirteen years, we shall vanquish them. Please allow it, father. The blind king did not hesitate. He replied, Bring the Pandavas back at once, even if they are well on their way. Let them return and play one more round. All this must have been going on in front of the full court, because Bhishma, Drona, Kripa, Vidur, and Vikarna all reacted to this order by begging the king to rethink this decision. Even Dhritarashtra's queen Gandhari was there listening, and she warned her husband against this course of action. She was tormented with grief because she loved her son, but yet was committed to the cause of proper dharma. She pleaded to the king. When Duryodhana was born, the wise steward said it is better to send this defiler of his race to the next world. And no sooner was he born than he howled like a jackal. Take notice, because he will be the end of this house. Do not prefer the opinions of untrained children. Do not be the cause of the destruction of your line. Who would anger the Pandavas now that they are keeping the peace? The king was philosophical in his reply, but he did not change his mind. He said, Surely, my queen, if our line must end, I shall not be able to stop it. Let it be as they wish. The Pandavas must return. By this point, the Pandavas had nearly reached their capital of Indraprastha, but they were intercepted by King Dhritarashtra's messenger, who summoned them back to Hastinapur for one more round of dice. The messenger said, The gambling hall has been carpeted, and the dice are ready. Your father invites you to come and play. The virtuous Dharma king Yudhishthira was as philosophical as Dhritarashtra. He said, It is at God's disposal that all creatures find good or bad. Although I know that the old man's invitation to gamble will bring ruin, I cannot disobey his summons. Thus, knowing that they were walking into a trap, the brothers returned to the gambling hall and sat down at the dice table. Shakuni was there with his nephew Durodhana, and he laid out the rules for this final wager. He said, the old man restored your wealth and freedom, and I praise him for that. But there is one more throw, and to the winner will go a great prize. If you win, we shall go into the forest for twelve years, clothed in deer skins, and on the thirteenth year we'll live in disguise, and if found out, we will return to the forest for another twelve years. On the other hand, if you should lose this round, then you must go to the forest for twelve years, together with your wife. When the thirteen years are over, Either you or your cousins will have your kingdoms back as is proper. Now, let's roll the dice and let fate decide. It was pretty obvious to all the spectators that nothing good could come out of this wager, no matter who won, and they all knew by now that Shakuni was a cheat. Someone in the crowd cried out, Will this not spell the destruction of the Kurus? Yudhishthira answered him, How could a king like me, who lives by his dharma, fail to return when summoned? I shall play with you, Shakuni. Shakuni picked up the dice, made his throw, and cried, I've won. Probably anticipating this outcome well in advance, the Pandavas immediately set to changing their princely robes for deerskins. Observing this, Duryodhana's toady brother Dushasan announced the new reign of his eldest brother, the absolute sovereignty of the illustrious King Duryodhana has commenced. Now, the wheel of fate has turned, 
Now the sons of Pandu have been defeated and have been thrown into hell for an endless time, bereft of their happiness, bereft of their kingdom, for years without end. They were power mad, laughing at us, but now they go to the forest defeated and robbed of their wealth. Dushasan's mind then turned to their noble wife Draupadi. The sagacious king Drupad of Panchala made a serious error in allying his daughter with the Pandavas, because now they are eunuchs. They are no longer men to Draupadi. While Shakuni's terms never mention celibacy as part of the deal, it appears that going to the forest in deerskins was a commonly understood form of penance which included celibacy. Dushasan then addressed Draupadi directly, saying, Now that you see your princes reduced to deerskins, penniless and homeless, what joy shall you find? You should choose a new husband. All the Kurus are assembled here, masterful and rich. Choose one of them to be your husband. Don't let this turn of fate distress you. Bhima finally rose to the bait, and he made one more promise. Insolent churl, I shall kill Duryodhana. Arjuna shall kill Karna. Sahadev shall kill Shakuni. I shall kill Duryodhana in battle with my club, and I shall push his head into the earth with my foot. As for this harsh and foul-mouthed Dushasan, I shall drink his blood like a lion. The two Karava brothers were unfazed by these impotent threats, and Duryodhana mocked Bhima by stomping around, clenching his fists and glaring around in a bad imitation of Bhima's fury. At the same time, Dushasan laughed and pointed, calling Bhima a cow. The Pandavas kept their composure, but Arjun seconded Bhima's threats swearing to uphold his part of the bargain by killing Karna. Sahadev chimed in, swearing to kill Shakuni. Nakul had not been assigned any victims, so he declared his own targets. This brood of Dhritarashtra, who have flung harsh insults at Drupad's daughter, these moribund crooks will soon enough be sent to Yama's country. I shall soon empty the earth of these sons of Dhritarashtra. As for Yudhishthira, he maintained his composure as usual, and merely bade farewell to his uncle the king and to all the other nobles present. Vidur praised Yudhishthira's restraint, and invited Kunti, the Pandava's mother, to stay in his home while her sons were roughing it in the forest. As the Pandavas exited the hall, Kunti came to them and made her farewells. Finally, she tearfully turned to her daughter-in-law Draupadi and said, My calf, do not worry. You know the dharma of women, and I have no need to preach to you. These Kurus are lucky that you have not burned them to ashes with your anger. Guarded over by the Dharma of your elders, you will soon come to better times. The Pandavas then set out down the road leading to the forest. The blind king Dhritarashtra then summoned his steward Vidur and questioned him, asking him to describe the scene of his nephew's departure. Vidur said, Kunti's son Yudhishthira has covered his face with his shawl, and Bhishma has spread his arms as wide as they will go. The left-handed archer Arjun follows the king, scattering sand, and Madri's son Sahadev goes with his face all streaked. Nakul is much distressed in his thoughts and is walking with his whole body covered in dust. Krishna Draupadi is holding her face in her hair, crying, and their priest Dhamya is chanting the gruesome chants of death, and as he walks he holds up kusha grass in his hand. The old king found the description foreboding yet strange. He asked Vidor to explain the strange postures of his nephews. Vidor said, Even though, with your connivance, your sons took his riches and kingdom, the mind of the wise king Yudhishthira does not stray from his dharma. Although consumed by fury over their trickery, he remains compassionate and refuses to cast the evil eye. That is why the Pandava king goes with his eyes covered, lest he burn these folks to the ground with his wrathful glare. As for Bhima, he is holding out the arms to show that he is ready to use them against his enemies. Kunti's son, the left-handed archer Arjun, scatters sand to show the numbers of enemies he will kill with his arrows. Lest anyone recognize his face today, Sahadeva has streaked his face and is thus traveling with his king. Nakula does not want to carry away the hearts of the women who see him walking to the forest, and so he has covered his body with dust to conceal his good looks. Dressed in her single garment, Disheveled and weeping, wet and besmirched with blood, Draupadi has made this prediction. For those who have done this to me, thirteen years from now, their wives will have their husbands dead, their sons dead, their friends and relatives dead, their bodies smeared with the blood of their relatives, their hair loosened, and themselves in their period. The women shall offer up the water to their dead, as the Pandavas take possession of the city of the elephant, Hastinapur. 
Daumia, their wise priest, has said, When the Karavas have all been killed in war, their own priests will likewise be chanting these chants of the dead. The townspeople are crying on all sides at the loss of their protectors and benefactors. As these superior men departed Hastinapur, lightning flashed in a cloudless sky and the earth trembled. The sun was eclipsed when no eclipse was due, meteors exploded around the city, and vultures, jackals, and crows were heard around the temples of the city. Such were the grave omens that occurred when the Pandavas departed for the forest to spell the Bharata's doom, king, at your own ill counsel. If all that wasn't enough to terrify the old king, the sage Narada suddenly appeared right there in the middle of the court, and he predicted, Thirteen years from now, the Kauravas who are here will perish, through Duryodhana's guilt and the Pandavas' might. When he finished speaking, the greatest of divine seers strode up to the sky and disappeared. <laughs> 